and talking about the oboe. And, of course, everything surrounding it. Now, <clears throat> I'm your host, the RPG Guy, and this is another episode of Orchestra, how to arrange and, and compo- how to arrange music for video game music for um, concert band and orchestra. Now, of course, the video game portion has been kind of shown off to a degree. We, we've gotten into the styles, the techniques. We've ta- we're now getting into orchestration. <clears throat> and we're talking about every group of instruments. And remember, this isn't like an advanced tutorial. This is very much just the fundamental understandings. Um, if I get enough questions about maybe specifics, I'll do a separate video on that. I already am considering doing a special video on music writing software, but that's closer to the end of the series. Um, but today, because we talked about flute the other day, the, other, the last like two days ago, and I'm actually a little under the weather, so if my voice is very kind of grainy and grindy, I, I do apologize. <clears throat> or if I cough or <coughs> anything like that, that's pretty much because, uh, yeah, I'm not not feeling so hot. So oboe is going to be in a, in a paired family here. When we think of the family of oboes, we think of oboe, English horn, oboe d'amour, bass oboe, and so on. And we'll talk about... It's not on there. You don't see it up there, but we'll talk about bass oboe and some other brethren in a little bit. There's two other brethren. Um, so hang tight, but we will talk about that. But anywho, all oh, by the power of great skill. The oboe family and the bassoon family are really the only family that carry the nasal characteristics within the woodwind section. Um, when we think of oboes, like in Peter and the Wolf, we think of the duck... If it's being played, you know, when we think of sad, sad, very, very melancholy um, uh, solos for an, an instrumental solos that sound sad and melancholy, we think of the English horn, you know, whether it's Sibelius, uh, Swan of Tanella, or the oboe solo from Sch- uh, Schindler's List. We always affiliate, we usually affiliate the English horn with sad, somber passages. Um... And so, and then the oboe obviously being a relative of that. Now there is, <clears throat> being the primary family member, there is also another oboe that we're going to do a little talking about, but there's not much to really say uh, about it. Um, but I put it up there anyway just to show you that Finale does actually have it pre, you know, like has it preloaded. Um, the other oboes, bass, oboe, hecophone, and lupophone are not in Finale. You'd have to input them yourself. Uh, which is fine. You can just emulate a, a tuba line um, and whatnot and just do it that way or a uh, Barry sax thing and do it that way. It's not a big deal, but we'll talk about those instruments when we get there. I'm going to try to keep this all contained in one episode because there's not as much to talk about <clears throat> with the extended family of the oboe outside the English horn. Oboes with their nasal quality have a few things that are very intricate about them. They have a honking strong low bottom you know a standard oboe can usually get down to a b flat and i would expect it to and probably the most realistic uh skill would be to get up to maybe an f an oboe can go up to a g but it's not that good of it's not a good option it's not a good idea and i'll explain why that is uh, in a minute <clears throat> and then we'll talk about some other ranges as well going forward. So the lowest note being the B flat, which I only put a B natural, so my do we put it our polar jaws. There we go. Um, and what you need to know is, I would say there, um, is that the range of the oboe is very distinct. It has very different sounds, pretty much polar opposite to that of the flute. It's got a reedy tone quality. Um, it honks on the bottom. Now, a good oboe player doesn't make it honk, and that's, that's, but that's not what I'm getting at. It's a bigger, less controlled sound. It's um, a strong, robust, outgoing sound. Um... In high school players and younger, it can be uh, misconstrued as a honk. It's kind of a honking noise, um, which is what 
the other two oboes are for, which is oboe d'amour and English horn. That's what those instruments are for, primarily. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, <clears throat> it is not mellow by any means. <clears throat> Writing low for oboe and piano is normally considered a, 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 an orchestral middle finger to an oboe player. They don't like that because that's not the nature of the instrument. We're talking like low, B flat to D. Now, obviously, there are professionals that might come across these videos. I'm referring to the standard middle high school and college concert band and orchestra orchestral environments. Professionally, you can write low B flats, you can write low Cs and Ds, um, and get those sounds. But keep this in mind: if you're going to do that, you're going to be paying out the ass for a professional player. If you have access to professional players then think of these more like guidelines, but not necessarily rules that for any reason need to be followed. <clears throat> um, move, so that lower range it will have a very honk-like honk quality with the nasal, you know, with the nasal uh, relationship as far as the, with the nasal quality. Um, as far as the bottom of the oboe goes, it usually pairs very nicely with things like trumpet and trombone. Um, as opposed to maybe doubling it up with other parts of the woodwind family outside bassoon because it doesn't have because flute clarinet and saxophone do not share the same sound qualities as the oboe and bassoon do so having a low oboe being the only woodwind playing low either will alter the sound that you're probably trying to achieve or you need emphasis on the bottom so those are some things to think about. If you're writing for high school and middle school bands or orchestras, writing those notes are very counterintuitive um, when other instruments can play anything, any of those notes better. And, and, you know, like trumpet. Trumpet could do that. Oh, I, but I want it to sound thinner. Okay, mute it. You know, put a mute on it. Put a stop mute in there or something. But in general practice, writing below anywhere from maybe anywhere from B flat to low D you're going to get a honking quality out of most young players <clears throat> as opposed to a professional who would probably play those very nicely um, as a instead of talking about maybe the highest notes the next big range that I think is a really good range is here um, now, obviously, E through F, E, you know, E flat, E, F, F sharp are not in there, but they're kind of just, you get players that most of the, in, mo in most intense situations, I could say that's fine, too. Okay, just to, to narrow that down. Between the E flat and the D above the staff, the, the, the D above the staff, <clears throat> to me, is the primary range of the oboe. It's where you find most players hanging out. You could go higher. You could even go to an E-flat rather comfortably as well. You could also go to an E-natural comfortably as well. But going beyond that, you start running into a problem. And this is um, indicative of all the oboe family. Um, is the higher the oboe goes, the thinner the pitch gets. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily mean how loud they can play, but the pitch doesn't cut through like a flute does. It really doesn't. Um, not at the same level as a piccolo or, or a flute. And in some respects with the other ob oboe, f members of the oboe family, the oboe actually gets softer. And those are things that in the high range you may, may not want. There are exclusions to this rule, and I'll give you some of those exclusions later. But playing up to high E, E flat is relevant because you look at things like Rhapsody in Blue. You know, that's, that's up there. That's up there on the top of the oboe, and um, and, and it, it's played well and fine and p p punches right through. You get above a E flat, and you start floating up into the F and the double G range, which there are fingerings for double G. There are fingerings all the way. Go all the way up to double C for oboe. Um, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Okay. Now... <clears throat> Now that we've talked about the range, that's the range of the instrument. It's very easy to describe. Oboe in, in, in nature is very um, melodic. It, it, it's, it plays very beautiful melodic passages, and it should always be used in such a regard. You can get other sound effects out of it by, you know, you can get buzzing sounds by making both reeds 
by having the player make both reads vibrate the, uh, each read differently at the same, but at the same time, um, I, you know, those are more neat effects. But not every oboist, especially in in uh, not non college students or or, I mean, uh, anything lower than college students, they're not going to know how to do that. And most of them don't. Um, so I would recommend staying away from those sound effects too, to a degree. Um, now. The range, like I said, the primary range, even the secondary range, that oboe is a very melodious instrument. It thrives playing long, drawn-out melodic lines, not running around. This is a very big misconception, and I hate to say it, composers and arrangers do this way too often, and it's usually openly mocked and looked down on in the community, the arrangement community. Um, is people who cut and paste flute lines in the oboe part. Okay, this happens at a ridiculous and absor exorbitant amount, where it's just a cut and paste part of the flute part, maybe even written down an octave, because obviously they're not going to be playing high Fs and Gs, uh, you know, in the middle school band or high school band environment. They're, you're not going to see that very often. Um, but they don't, a lot of them, a lot of them don't change it. They just literally flat out cut and paste a flute line into an oboe line. And again, that's another big middle finger to an oboe player. People wonder why oboe players can be abrasive sometimes, or maybe a better term are jackasses. And I don't trust me. I play oboe. I know I play flute too, but I play oboe. I have oboe students. I have flute students too, but I'm, I'm just saying that, when you see oboe parts, professional oboe parts, when you see a famous composers write for oboe, they are not considering, they're not thinking about flute and just going, oh, let's just have it double the flute. There are times when it does, but they're very specific times. And usually in an oboe part, you can see the oboe and clarinet running around the instrument. The oboe might be doing eighth notes between staccato eighth notes. So you might have in the flute and clarinet part, you might have the oboe go It's a very traditional um, and very well-written thing because oboe doesn't is not an instrument that easily runs around compared to the relatives of the flute and the, the saxophone and the clarinet. Bassoon shares something similar to this too. Let's just stick to, but we'll stick to oboe. They don't like running around a lot. They can, they absolutely can, but there are times when it's not something that fits well with the oboe. And when some people say, "Well, why? Why is it harder to do runs on an oboe than it is a flute and a clarinet and a saxophone?" They share the same fingerings, and this is a big misconception across all platforms of, of arranging and writing and composing, they do not share all the same fingerings. They share some fingerings. They do not share them all. I cannot stress that enough. I actually was asked that question by one of my composition students who plays trumpet, or tri I'm sorry, trombone. And I'm just like, no, no, I'm sorry, dude. An F on a flute, an F natural, is, is one, fingers one, two, three on the left hand and one on the right hand. That F is also the same for saxophone. Yes. For clarinet, well, that's its own fucking problem because it's that's the fingering for one of those Fs. For oboe, this is an F sharp. Well, what's the closest for F natural? Well, what fingering <clears throat> emulates... Uh, uh, what finger fingering um, does the oboe do when it plays F natural that the other one wins do? And I go, none. F has three different fingerings and it's always based on what note you're coming from or moving or, or moving away from. Or moving towards what what note you're coming from, or what mo note you're moving towards. There are three fingerings for F, and none of them are fun to play when you compare them to fingerings other instruments have. Bassoon is the king of nasty fingerings, but oboe is is very much the queen, and it's the drama queen to some degree. But uh, it's definitely the queen of fucked up fingerings, because these fingerings come in the weirdest places. And they are the weirdest fingerings. For F, you have, um, you put your first, you know, it's, you still put one, two, and three down on the left hand, but you're going to put one down on the right hand. You're going to put the sliver, <clears throat> a sliver key down on the, uh, or I'm sorry, it's a forked fingering, so it's one and three, and then you have to also press this little, pretty much the E flat key with your pinky, and that will play an F. There's also a fingering where you use 
um, E, and then there's a left-handed E flat, and then there's a right-handed E flat, which is one, two, and the third finger, and you, it's a sliver key in the center. And you, th those are the three fingerings, and none of the other woodwinds share share that fingering. You could argue it's close to a chromatic F sharp on a saxophone or a clarinet, but it's a pretty hard sell because it, the reach is much different. It feels much different and whatnot. So when you have a lot of runs, especially in modern music and the runs that make a lot of sense and you're not sense, but you have runs going in and out between different notes and jumping around a lot, your oboe player tends to sharpen his reed knife and, and goes for your jugular because it's just not an indicative thing for that instrument to do or an indicative. It's not a, a traditional thing that's done for oboe and the instrument isn't really designed that way. Now I'm not saying that it can't be done nor am I suggesting that you never do it, but I'm always saying be very careful for the ensembles you're writing for. If you write, you know, these really technically challenging oboe lines, you're going to be up shit, uh, shit's creek without a paddle. And it can, uh, in turn, harm the odds of you getting a piece of music played. And this carries through all of the oboe-type instruments. The oboe family, and it is its own family, mind you. Now, when it comes to playing oboe, it's a gorgeous instrument. And again, it thrives in slower passages, exposed passages. Some people would argue it is the premier solo instrument of the wood section in, in ensemble playing. It's distinct. It gets all pretty much all the gorgeous lines. So I guess in return, people make that argument that that's the way to go. Um, when you want to write a beautiful, luscious you know, woodwind solo... You know, if you don't know what instrument to give it to, oboe is usually not a bad option. It usually is not because it is necessarily notation wise and range wise not a hard instrument to write for. It doesn't have, a, it's not a four octave instrument in, in general writing. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't thrive in technically difficult passages. And when I say technically difficult, I'm talking about advanced rhythms, fast run, running around, and arpeggiated passages. It, it doesn't, uh, that was my cell phone. It doesn't thrive in this environment, so the tendency is to, you know, stay away from it. So, anyway, sorry, I'm just looking at this text and I shouldn't be because I'm recording. Um, it, it wasn't for, I was making sure it wasn't work related. So, there's a lot of different things that, that can be done. And should be done with oboe and that's one of the big ones that I like to do I love to write luscious oboe parts um, and this carries in for English horn as well these two instruments again thrive in luscious luscious uh, writing and oftentimes um, young composers and I was guilty of this myself when I was younger would just um, even cut and paste um, like a clarinet part or a flute part and shove it into the oboe part when the whole band is going, when they're better off doubling something maybe that the trumpet's doing um, or that the trombone is doing because that's more in, 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 in sync with its technical level. You're not going to have trumpets running around in 16th notes runs at like 140 uh, beats per minute. You're not, you're not going to, you're not going to see that very often. And so when you're asking about doubling where if I need to fill the orchestra orchestral sound, where should I do it? Oboe, French horn, and trombone, even though it'll be a lot higher in pitch, those are places where you could use oboe to double. Um, and sometimes in a band environment, you already have altos doubling horns, so it makes more sense to just give them a trumpet line. So the, just as a, a rule of thumb, these are just some, some suggestions for oboe, for oboe specifically, um, and why we talk about oboe in such a weird sense. Um, now again, I'm not suggesting that you, you, I'm not suggesting that you always write your oboe parts this way. Oboes can do small runs or like little attempts at glisses, like they can do that stuff. It's fine. It's, it's constant running around. It's having them play in very complex key signatures, anything over four flats, four flats or more. Um, and you have them running around at 16th notes, you're asking for a more 
college level virtuistic oboe player and you any qualities that are nice about the oboe are lost there are examples however of good oboe runs and good oboe arpeggiated passages i would recommend listening to Saint, the first movement of saint sans oboe sonata and there's actually this really gorgeous set of uh arpe this really gorgeous arpeggio um and it just shows that the oboe can do it but traditionally, they're traditionally they're it, it, it you know obviously it only happens once in the entire in the entire movement, but they can do runs and you hear them do runs in that same piece. You hear them go, Bo-lia, Bo-lia, you know they're thirty seconds, but it's all within a comfortable key that the oboe does well in, which I th- I forget what key that piece is in off the top of my head, but <clears throat> that's you know again it has to fit the instrument that's playing here now to have it do 30 second note runs up and down for you know four to six measures is pushing your luck uh for, with most oboe players so I, I wouldn't do it again if you're if you're a student and you're learning how to write stick to luscious um very drawn out oboe passages and the oboe won't uh the oboe will uh, the oboe will show you oboist will show you that that's where it thrives Again, it doesn't really thrive in fast passages compared to the clarinet and flute brethren that it competes with to a degree when people just arguably cut and paste flute and clarinet parts into the oboe part. I I, I really stress people to not do that very often, especially during runs and arpeggiated passages, because what works for flute and clarinet doesn't always necessarily work for oboe. And it needs to stop. And I, I swear, I am so sick of teaching master classes at universities and then seeing these passages and then bringing an oboist in and telling that oboist to play it and they play it and it sounds like ass. And it's not because they can't play it. They are playing it. The instrument doesn't sound good doing those types of passages, which is, again, a reason why a lot of composers stay away from those types of uh, constant running around passages. Now, there are pieces that allow for that but it's under very specific conditions again writing in like if if you ask an oboe player to run around in g major uh they would love it it's a key they love to run around in um d major again another key oboists love to run around in but you know when you you write something in five flats uh four flats they're not going to want to do a lot of running around in there it requires a lot of intricate technique to do that. Probably some of the best fingering technique you'll see in the upper woodwind section just to be able to do that. Um, and again, I'm not saying it can't be done. I may be a little biased in saying that. In what I'm saying, because I've just been around a lot of people who failed at doing it. And these are college students who go to rec- you know good universities. I've seen them not be able to play those passages because they are in a sense ridiculous for them to try give it to a flautist boom they can sight read that shit you know that's that's that easy um give it to an oboist there's 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 concerns there are very big concerns um now obviously if you have professionals do whatever you want but I always like to tell young arrangers and people who are not writing like professionally and making a shit ton of money doing it you need to be a little bit more realistic okay and 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 I can't stress that enough you have to kind of get off the you know get off the moon for a second um and realize that accessibility is what gets things published not necessarily how good it sounds there's a lot of music scores I've heard out there that have never been published never will be published because for as good as of a piece it sounds there's things in it that are just not they don't hit the right notes with certain uh, instrumentalists. So unless you have an all professional group, publishers tend to stay away from stuff that's very abstract and or in a, in some sense grade seven, and it has a lot of really really difficult passages. One of the things that a publisher has looked at with my music in the past, he even told me is I look at oboe lines, and I look to see if there's some, you know things in the oboe line that are just so difficult. It would take a virtuistic player to play them. And that right there is a red flag to not publish something. Because we're not going to be able to market it to high school groups. We're not going to be able to market it to uh, undergrad universities. And so these are problems that they... And and he's openly saying this is a problem we look for. 
when we look at you know young you know new talent and we're looking for new pieces to publish so there's a lot to take from that just from him saying that one thing there's a lot to process and sort out so hopefully that explains my ration my reasoning my rationale for saying that you know you, you get enough red flags in a piece of music there's no chance they're going to publish it and you're back to the drawing board so anyway that covers oboe for the most part a lot of these rules apply to English horn as well. Now, oboe dio more um, is just really an, a situational instrument, much like a bass flute, alto flute, uh, soprano sax. You don't traditionally see them in band pieces or orchestral pieces unless you're looking for that specific sound. It's a little bit, br uh, I want to say, a little bit more brighter than an oboe sound to a degree. It's more, not brighter, brighter is not the right word. It's a bit more piercing than a regular oboe a bit a bit more um driven i don't know i'm trying i can't think of the word to explain it but oboe dio more is something where you could look at colleges to have pieces written for oboe dio more because they're used in the baroque period as far as common use um the only reason to pull out an oboe dio more is if you're writing a very large piece like a something in symphony length you know, that's like at least 15 minutes long to as long as a 30, 45, whatever. Something long. If you're composing a very long piece of music and the oboe d'amour is the only oboe that, you know, you have maybe two oboes and oboe d'amour, I guess that's fine, but I, I don't see the point in using it. <clears throat> I personally almost never use it unless I need that specific sound. I've only used it when I was... I only, the only time I ever used it when I was writing in college. And, and I never really used it since. Because it's such a distinct sound that you, number one, want to have... You need to get have that sound. Or number two, it's not relevant. It's like it's, you're just doing it to do it. And I don't think that you should ever write it for an instrument just to, just because. Um, and you like I said, you almost never see it played. So there's no point in writing for it very often. Unless you want that specific sound. And yes, it is in a different key. The English horn. Now, here is my favorite woodwind. This is my favorite woodwind to write for. <coughs> English horn and play, actually. The English horn is gorgeous. It is a beautiful sounding instrument. Um, and it's very underrated. A lot of composers... I, I always get the feeling that there's some kind of secondary issue... Uh, with writing for English horn, like some people don't want to, some people don't have to, or people just don't write for it in general, and they want because either they have to learn how to alter oboe two to English horn within the same line, or they have to write an English horn part separately, which you could do, because keep in mind, orchestras and concert bands have the same layout of double reeds. They should. They don't have to, obviously, but they should. You should have one first, one second, and one auxiliary. And the auxiliary is usually an English hornist. Um, I always tell a lot of young schools that this is the this is the way you should do it. Okay, and if you don't have an English horn part that needs to be played, that other oboe is played second oboe. It's just as simple as that. Uh, in orchestra, it's usually oboe one, oboe two, and then English horn as needed. Um, and then obviously somebody doubling English horn if it's only oboe one, oboe two, and then halfway through a piece. Oboe 1 or Oboe 2 switches to English horn, depending on who you want. But it's usually the responsibility of Oboe 2. Okay, so keep those things in mind as well. This applies to concert band as well. You don't want too many oboes more than that. And there's a reason for that. You know how there's no trumpet Christmas. There's also no oboe Christmas. Um, <laughs> um, my, my, I had a, a college uh, oboe professor said do you know how you get four oboes to play in tune and i said how and he goes you shoot two of them and i'm like wow that's fucking dark and he's like well that's how you do it they you know it's just not you know it's a very difficult thing to do casually is to get more than two oboe players to play in tune with each other um this is obviously it's a stereotype it's not necessarily true but it is a fun joke that exists because it is very hard to get more than two oboists to play in tune with each other. Have enough t hard time for as a, in a high school concert band environment to even get an oboist. Usually that's not an issue. But when it does become an issue, 
Um, your uh, your best option is to get is to uh, get one of them on English horn, um, and you may have to arrange parts in your music for that English horn. You can do that. I, I don't see a problem with that. But English horn is just the most mellow sounding instrument out there. It's great. The bottom of the instrument has a slight honked quality to it, but it's nothing major. And on English horn, it's very easy to control. As opposed to an oboe, where the oboes, low Bs, low Cs, and B flats are very honkish in nature, the English horn, which is a lower, which is an F, um, has just this gorgeous, gorgeous tone. And because of this, because of this tone, it 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 just thrives on the bottom and middle parts of the instrument. And, and I hate to say it, it has one of the most fluent ranges of any woodwind instrument. It has a full control over the bottom and the middle and the top until you get above maybe B flat above the staff. So if we're writing for English horn, we can get down from there, usually to about, I'd say here. B flat to arguably B flat if you have the the range for it okay um, that right there is the perfect English horn range you don't need to play it you can play it higher than that okay it does have um, the same fingerings not same fingerings but it, it's very similar fingerings to oboe um, you can go as high as you know an E flat an F but it suffers from the same problems that um, it has the same problems that uh, that oboe has, except to the extreme. It gets super thin, incredibly thin, almost inaudibly thin once you get that high. Um, an example of an English horn playing that high would be Brahms Symphony 1 and 2. I want to say there's an English horn solo that's... And it's just way up there. And what's funny is almost nobody's playing. Uh, during those sections, um, there's the, the orchestration is on the thinner side, and it has to cater to the English horn player because <clears throat> it's hard to get that to project. I mean, there are people that do it and can do it well. I remember practicing my ass off to play that solo when I was in college, but and I didn't even start as an, uh, an oboist. I was a saxophonist to a clarinetist to a flutist to an oboist, um, and I played oboe English horn in the orchestra and. Getting up to that note and getting it to speak over everyone else playing is is tough to do. It can be done, but look at I'm saying it's done in a soloistic environment. The English horn player is the solo. He is the feature of that line, and everybody's going to cater to that sound. The, a good orchestra will be listening to make sure they can hear that English horn player and not cover him up. Um. Yeah, I want to say it was Brahms. Symphony 2 or Symphony 1? It was one of the... It was not... Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, it's Borodin. Borodin Symphonies 1 and 2. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it was Borodin. Uh, I got my B's all mixed up. Borodin. Borodin Symphonies number 1 and 2. Where the English horn is playing those wonderful, wonderful solos on way up on the top. But again, that's... that. That's If you have the whole orchestra going at Forte, Mezzo Forte, writing for English horn up there is not recommended. Um, because you're, any functionality, any purpose that the English horn serves is going to be covered up by the rest of the group. And you're only going to have one English horn player. You're not going to have like an army of English horn players. You're not going to have like an English horn section that's like 10 people. Okay, you're not going to have that. I, I guarantee that's a very hard thing to get. Unless you're in college and you get every oboist that has an English horn on in the college and make an English horn ensemble. It's just not, it's not practical. <laughs> So, and I have had to correct young composers who wrote, you know, Divisi for English horn. It's like, you have two oboists and now you want two English hornists? Ha! <laughs> That's not, you're not going to get that most of the time. And even if you did, what's the purpose of doing it? When you could have, because at one point, one of the notes, some of the notes were high enough for an oboe to do it. And he had no oboes playing, he just had two duetting English horns. I mean, I'm not trying to stymie, like stifle or, you know, st make people submit to rules or anything you can break rules all you want but I want I hope that these discussions make you successful 
I want you to be successful composers. And writing for two English horns in the middle of a piece of regular standard, you know, concert band piece is very silly. It's not something that most people would want to buy into and in turn a publisher would look looks at these things and goes, well, why would you do that? I don't know if we're going to get a lot. And, and it's exposed. If they're just doubling what other people are doing, I don't give a crap. I think most people wouldn't give a crap. If you have two English horn parts that are being doubled in, you know, the clarinets or you, you have them being doubled in the French horns or trombones, that's fine. Nobody's going to care. They're just going to use the trombones primarily and unless you provide that, that, that second English horn player yourself, you may never hear it the way it was intended to be heard. Outside of like Finale and you know, you know, Giga Studio and all these other recordings that are out there, recording studio softwares and stuff that generate MIDI sounds. So that's the you know, so being be being very realistic with the standard orchestration is good. Um, and knowing how English horn works again, English horn is very melodic. It's very soloistic in nature. Um, we don't traditionally want it running around too much. It shares that affiliation with the oboe. It can. We just don't want it doing it that often. But I love English horn. It's a beautiful instrument to write for. And if you need to communicate sadness, um, you need to communicate, you know, somber, something somber, something, something, uh, something sad. English horn will do that almost on its own, regardless of what key you're playing in. It really doesn't matter. English horn will do that much work for you on its own. And like I said, there's some gorgeous music to listen to out there. Another example of it would be uh, the Rodrigo uh, Concerto de Anuez, which is a, a guitar concerto where the English horn is the feature. And it's, it's the only instrument I could really see as the instrument to play the solo. That when the guitar is not playing that its own solo, it has that, and it's this nice, beautiful uh, sound that uh, it makes it, it sets the mood up for the guitarist when they first come in. It's like a gorgeous duet within itself, and that's one of the best examples I think out there for English horn writing, next to like I said the Schindler's List theme, next you know the solo from there. Um, and, you know, and if you want something a little bit more technical, listen to the Borodine Symphonies 1 and 2. Uh, but somber English horn playing is usually w the, the area to write for. So, um, now we're going to talk about three other oboes. There are three more oboes in the oboe family, and they're all oboes I can sum up pretty quick, and this will end our video, too. Is bass oboe, hecklephone, and lupophone. Yes, you heard right. Now, let's talk about bass oboe. You see them once in a while. They're interesting. But like I said, and this is going to carry over to the hecklephone and the lupophone, you never really see them. You do not really see music written for them uh, very often. And there are people who go out of their way and say, oh, they should be written for. And I just look at people and go, you're an asshole, you know? Fuck you. No. You don't want to write for bass oboe, lupophone, or hecklephone because most chances and most of the time you'll never see them. You'll never be able to get one to come in and do it unless you've got significant coin to do it. Now, bass oboe you'll see probably the most of the three, but the hecklephone, I think there's only a hundred of them in circulation right now, and you know. And like a lot of people are renting them from each other, so that's you have to think of it that in that context too. It's not a good instrument to write for, even if you're trying to get that sound. I would I would advise for you to um, look in other directions, look at look in other uh, look at other avenues for acquiring um, a better or similar sound. Because bass, oboe, hecklephone, and lupophone, which I highly suggest you go like on YouTube and listen to those instruments, they are very distinct. They're just not practical. They're just not affordable. Um, that's an instant, instant red flag for a, a publisher to want to pr publish your arrangements or your music, because obviously the odds of you having that, ha uh, the odds of that instrument being available are very rare. You sometimes will hear uh, bass oboes being used in concert band environments, but they're very rare. I want to say the last time one was ever used 
traditionally is in the Children's March by Percy Allen Grange, by Percy Grange, Percy Granger. And there is a recording of it being used. It's the English horn solo actually it was supposed to be played by a bass oboe. <clears throat> but outside of that, <clears throat> there's very uh, little demand for bass oboe. Uh, oh, and the planets. I forgot. The planets has a bass oboe part. But again, it's not necessary in that in either of those two pieces because the English horn just plays that part for it instead. Or, you know, it's a high bassoon part. Somebody else covers it, and it's, signif it's significant and sufficient. And it doesn't, you know... But like I said, when you want that specific sound as a composer, you're going to be... You have the tendency to want to write for it. I very much uh, disagree with doing that. I don't think you should. I think you should find other avenues uh, for those instruments. So... Hopefully, this gives you guys a pretty good idea about oboe and English horn. Um, remember, too, when, when tuning your concert band, I, I still tell a lot of concert bands to do this. Orchestras do this automatically. The orchestra tunes to the oboe player. Um, more concert bands are starting to do it now more than ever. They're starting to tune to their oboe players because they're finding out in competition at the high school and middle school level specifically that they are getting better intonation results because of it. Um, because the oboe and English horn and, and that family of instruments are the most, um, you know, as far as t intonation goes, you want to lean towards them for your intonation. Um, and, you know, I don't need to explain why we do... You know, no, wait, let me rephrase. We, I don't need to exp explain, the, the, you know, shape it and explain it for orchestra. For concert bands, though, they a lot of concert bands still tune to the first clarinetist, and I would highly advise not doing that. I would highly advise into tuning to your oboe player on a concert A, and then as well as a concert B flat, because when we talk about saxophones, we'll even talk about the natural intonation issues that uh, can be observed on uh, in saxophone, and it's actually an interesting discussion. It's actually an anecdotal experience about intonation issues. Um, involving a high school band I was volunteering for that lives that, that it, I live near when I was helping them out to show them that you shouldn't tune to a concert F. Alto saxes should not tune to a concert F. It's not a good idea. So anyway, I hope this was informative and gave you a lot of insight um, on the fundamentals for writing for oboe and English horn parts. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about oboe and English horn, you're welcome to write them in the comments. If I didn't cover it here, I know there's a lot I didn't cover because if I did, I'd be going on for 30 videos just on how to write perfectly for oboe and English horn. Same with flute. I, I could go over all these different kinds of things and then and just go on forever. And I think that that's a waste of time. I think that the sooner you get the fundamental tools to start writing for these instruments, just start writing for them and go for it. Because if you fall, if you at least use my, what I'm saying as guidelines, you can't go wrong. As far as range, timbre, you know, the, the quality of the sound goes and whatnot. So thank you guys for stopping by. We'll see you next time. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Please take a moment to check out more episodes from the RPG Guy, Tuesday Night Team Up, and more. And please subscribe. Always support the channels you enjoy watching. And while you're at it, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. Keep on gaming hard. See you next time.